continuing on now in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 10, probably go through um, maybe verse 15 or so. But um, this section of Colossians, and really the whole letter to the Colossians, Paul's main focus here is just focus on Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Christ. Don't be distracted by any other things. Just focus on Christ and don't let go of him. Hold fast to him, right? He's the one. He's where wisdom is. He's where knowledge is. He's where growth happens. Like he's where unity is. Everything you need, everything you desire, everything you hope for, all of it is found in Christ. And you don't need to go looking anywhere else for it. Just focus on him. And he continues that in this section today. Um, last time we left off, I think in verse nine, but I want to start back in eight just to get the full context where he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental principles of the world and not according to Christ. It says, for in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him. Okay, so here he's saying, when he says this, for, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells. This is, again, harkening back to that picture of Christ as the temple, the true temple of God, right? The temple was the place where the people of God went to meet with him, the place where sin was atoned for, the place the place where the, the prayers were lifted up, the prayers of the people were lifted up upon the incense um, to the throne of God, okay? And so Jesus is that temple, the place where the glory dwells, the place where the God's presence is. Um, this is the place um, that, G, that the glory now dwells is in Christ. He says, in Christ, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells. Christ is the temple of the living God. He says, but in verse 10, it's cool. He says, and you have been filled in him. Okay, so this is that picture again, like verse I'm sorry, but like chapter one, where Paul's trying to give us the true picture of who Christ is in all of his majesty and all of his deity. When he said he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And in him, all things hold together. He says, he's before all things and in him, all things hold together. He is God. Jesus is God. He's creator, God. In him, all things hold together. He's always been, he is, and he always will be. Okay, that's why in earlier in this chapter, he said, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The, literally all the wisdom and knowledge that there is, is in Christ. You, you can't go looking anywhere else where you're going to find wisdom or knowledge that's not already in Christ. He literally holds the, the wisdom and the knowledge that undergirds the entire universe in himself and says he fills you. <laughs> He's in you. Christ is in us. Like like in chapter one, he says that, that this mystery is, the, the, is um, Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? Jesus Christ is in us and in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. I mean, powerful, awesome truth, just giving us this exalted vision and view of Jesus Christ. He says, in him, I mean, you've been filled in him, I'm sorry, the head of all rule and authority. Again, th this was the rule and authority. This is like the, the, the description of the demonic powers, the angelic powers, actually, whether they are the holy angels or the demonic um, rebellious ones. Um, the rule and authority in him, um, all the fullness of deity dwells and, and you've been filled in him, the head of all rule and authority. Like he literally rules over everything as the creator. He made everything, including the, the angels, both the fallen and the good. All things were made by him and through him and for him. And he holds it all together and he rules over all of it. And he has authority over all of it. So don't go looking anywhere else for any other power, any other knowledge, any other wisdom, any other thing. Everything is in him. Again, fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, don't be distracted. In verse 11, he says, in him also you were circumcised. Okay, now Paul's going to begin to address one specific threat to the church. And I think that's as far, we're going to just address this one today. Okay, and that was these legalistic Jewish believers who came probably from Jerusalem and they were going into these Gentile churches and they're trying to put these Gentile believers back under the law of Moses, okay? So in, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish faith, circumcision in a man indicates inclusion into the people of God, into the community of God, into the family of God, okay? You become one of God's people through 
the, the sacrament of circumcision, okay? And so these Jewish believers were coming into these Gentile churches and they're saying, okay, now good that you believe in the Jewish Messiah, but actually to become one of the people of God, to be identified with the people of God, the very first thing you gotta do, gentlemen, is to be circumcised. Right? If you don't do that, you got nothing. And then once that happens, you got to start observing those feast days and those new moons and the Sabbaths. You got to observe the dietary restrictions. So don't be eating shellfish and, you know, no more lobster for you. Don't eat pork. Um, don't don't be wearing clothes that are linen and wool mixed together, you know. So they're, they're trying to put all these legalistic requirements on these people who have already received salvation and redemption in Christ. Okay, so he's, what he's telling these Gentile believers, he says, he says, in him also, verse 11, you were circumcised, okay? Well, what does he mean by that? Because these are Gentiles. They were not circumcised. Like, you know, that was the very definition. The only ones who were were the Jewish people, okay? And so these are Gentiles. He's saying, in him you were circumcised. He says, with a circumcision made without hands, okay? This is a phrase that's used throughout Scripture to indicate something that God did, okay? This is not of human origin. This isn't something that, that could be done by a human ceremony or human uh, rite of passage or any other, other thing. This is something that God did, okay? So you, in Christ, were circumcised, okay? So he's saying, you know, you don't need to go get physically circumcised because you already were, okay? At the moment you believed, in the moment, the moment that you received salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. At that moment, you already were circumcised. You were already included into the family, into the community of God, in, into the people of God. You were counted as one of them. As Romans says, your uncircumcision at that moment was counted as circumcision, okay? You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, it was a circumcision of the heart. It's the cutting away not of the physical flesh of the foreskin, but a cutting away of the, the, the flesh nature, that sin nature, the old you, right? He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now he's tying in our, our baptism, okay? But I, here, I don't believe he's even talking about a physical baptism because you were circumcised not by baptism. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And in this case, you know, the physical circumcision of the Old Testament um, it didn't matter if you were circumcised, if you were still wicked and uncircumcised of heart. And there's pastors that say, be circumcised in your heart, right? Cut away that old, nasty, sinful, fleshy you, right? And be made new, okay? We're like, uh, I'm going to remove your heart of stone. I'm going to put in its place a heart of flesh. It's like a heart change that happens, right? Um, put my spirit in you. I'm going to cause you to walk on my statutes, to obey my commands. It's a whole spirit um, a transaction that takes place with God, okay? And now physical baptism, the sacrament of baptism is wonderful and he commands us to do it and we should do it. But in and of itself, it's a representation of a transaction that has already taken place where we've been buried with Christ, okay? The baptism going under the water represents us, the old us, the sin nature, the, the old sinful us, the lost us, the one who was separated from the covenant and the people of God going into the ground, going into the grave and being buried together with Christ. We're dying to that old you, that old me. You were also raised with him, he says, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Our faith is not in the fact that I look and I say, man, I'm still messed up. I still do wrong things. I still struggle to just, you know, obey God's law and all that stuff. But you know what? I was raised not in faith in my ability to obey the law, my ability to, to follow the commandments, my ability to be righteous. I'm saved. Um, because of, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Christ from the dead, that same power that raised Christ from the dead, that resurrected a man that was dead, completely dead, that same faith, that's the one that I, that's the one that I have my confidence in. That same act, the power that did all that, that's where I have my faith, okay? He says, and you, still talking to Gentiles, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcised decision of your flesh, in other words, you Gentile people who were outside of the covenant of God, who were spiritually completely dead, who were separated from the covenants and the prophets and the people and the life and the sacrifices and the redemption, you who were dead, okay, in your trespasses and sins. So, so in other words, you weren't like um, on your deathbed. You weren't drowning with one hand still out of the water trying to reach for salvation. No, you were dead. You're completely dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were completely unable to help yourself. A dead person can't crawl for help, can't cry for help. A dead person's just dead, okay? You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive. 
God made alive together with him. Okay, so God did all this work. He did it. He's the one that saved you. You're not saved because you're righteous. You're not saved because you're good. You're not saved because you're better than anybody because you're not. You're saved because God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Okay, so this is a transaction again, not made with hands. This is something that God did and does in us. He's the initiator. Okay, he's the one that follows through and he's also the one that's going to complete it. Um, on that day when Christ returns and glorifies us together with him. He says, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Okay, and so this is how God did it. He made us alive together. He forgave us our trespasses. He says, bye. Okay, bye. This is how he did it. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. Okay, what does this mean? Okay, I always think of it as that list of, uh, of my iniquity, of my sin, of my transgressions, and all the ways that I don't measure up, and all the ways that I failed to obey the law, all the ways that, that I have failed to measure up and live my life righteously as Christ did. That's that list. It's that list that the prosecuting eternity Satan can use against me um, to accuse me before my Father in heaven, right? He just takes that list and he goes, look at this. Look at this list. These are all the things he's done wrong. He hasn't done anything right. He hasn't lived right at all. He hasn't obeyed your commands. It's interesting because this verse is translated a little bit differently in the New King James. He says, um, He has made alive together with him, having forgiven all you all his, all his trespasses, having wiped out, he says, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, that was contrary to us. He says, this he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That handwriting of requirements. So the other one says that record of debt. This one says the handwriting of requirements. And that record of debt seems to indicate like that list of the ways that I haven't measured up to God's law. The handwriting of requirements reminds me of that finger of God that wrote on the tablets of stone. He wrote the handwriting of the requirements. This is my law. This is the measurement, okay? This is the plumb line. This is what you have to measure up to, to be righteous, to have a relationship with me right? He says, having wiped out that handwriting of requirements. So with either one, the way you look at it, you take the law and Satan stands before my father in heaven and says, look at all these rules. He hasn't done any of this stuff. He hasn't fulfilled any of this stuff. He hasn't kept any of these rules. He hasn't obeyed these laws. He's broken every single one of them. Look, here's his record of debt that stands against him and accuses him. But what this says is that he's, um, forgiven us by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. But how did he do that? It says right here in verse 15, verse 14. He says, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So how did God set aside the, the handwriting requirements? How did he cancel the record of debt that stood against us? It says he nailed it to the cross. God the Father nailed it to the cross. So Jesus Christ took that handwriting of requirements and he perfectly lived it out. He fulfilled it all in his life. He put on human flesh, clothed himself in human flesh, and perfectly obeyed the law of God his entire life and fulfilled all righteousness. Then he went to the cross, shed his blood, and paid the full penalty for my sins. When he was on that cross, the Father took the full record of my debt, the handwriting of requirements, nailed them to the cross with Christ, and the blood of cross completely saturated them and covered them and paid them in full. And so now I no longer live under a handwriting of requirements. I no longer live to try to try to earn my own righteousness through obedience to the handwriting of the law. I no longer live um, trying to pay for all of my own sin. Why? Because Jesus already fulfilled the handwriting requirements for me. He already paid the full record of my debt. This is the cool part in verse 15. He says, by doing this, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So just at that moment, when the enemy thought he had won, the savior of the world was hanging on a crucifix, a Roman crucifix, and he was breathing his last breath, giving up his spirit as his blood soaked the cross and the ground around the cross. And he said, I won. But at that moment, it says, the father disarmed the rulers and authorities, those demonic spirits that, that rule over this world, those things that have dominion over those who are born in this world in sin. It says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What does this mean? It means that he took away through Christ paying for my full record of debt, through Christ paying your full record of debt, by setting aside the handwriting of requirements that stood against us because Christ fulfilled them and then paid for our debt. Because of that, he took away the leverage of the demonic powers and spirits, the domain of darkness. This is what he means in chapter one, when Paul says, 
that the Father has delivered us from the domain of darkness, the domain, that the power, the rule, the authority. He's delivered us from that domain of darkness, and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, because he paid the full record of our debt through Christ's blood on the tree. We'll go on uh, in the next Bible study.